Thank you to Rabbi Fishman for this opportunity to uh, unmute. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for this invitation. Thanks, Rabbi Shalom, for this in, for uh, this opportunity to speak to some of the most important people in the world. Um, it's true. I go back a long way with Rabbi Fishman. We we studied together. You've just heard the secret of why he's such a good speaker, uh, and I owe to him an outstanding memory which was that in our show-and-tell class, he shechted a chicken and was mazaking me with part of the part of the mitzvah, and that was a class that stands out in my memory. So, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to speak to you. As you, Rabbi Berkowitz, said, your job is at the heart of what it is that we are, because we are what we eat. Let's spend a few minutes together. Uh, can people hear me? Can you maybe raise your hand or type me a greeting or something so I know you can hear me? Okay, good, good, good. Let's spend a few minutes looking at a deeper view, deeper insight, if you like, deeper layer to the concept of what it is that we do when we eat. And that, from that, I think, will flow naturally the importance, the central importance of your work. Um, let me ask a few questions, if I may. It should be obvious to everyone that eating is the central pillar of what it means to be human. You know, when Hashem created Adam... He put him in a garden of food, trees with fruit, fruit trees, and charged him with eating the fruit of the trees. It wasn't only a heter, from Mikol Eitzagan, from all the trees of the, of the garden, you may eat. He had to eat them. Eating is an absorbing of the world and transmuting it into something higher. Eating is the energy that keeps body and soul together, and it does it by absorbing the energy base of the world and incorporating it into what you are. I'm sure you all know, I don't have to tell you, that in Hasidus, the idea of eating is an elevation of the sparks, or an elevation of the Kedusha aspects, a sifting and elevating of parts of, the, of, the, of, the, of what you eat. In fact, one of the only justifications for eating meat, which is a very serious issue, as I'm sure you know, before the, the Mabul, the world was a vegetarian world, animals did not tear each other and eat each other alive, Possibly we get back to that in, in a messianic or post-messianic world. But the tikkun of the world, <coughs> the destruction is always has a tzad tikkun, always like that. And the tikkun in eating is that every level absorbs the one beneath it. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. The inanimate world is absorbed in the plant world. The plant world is absorbed in the animal world when it's eaten. The human eating the animal absorbs that, subsumes it, so to speak, and the whole food chain is elevated. That's why the Gemara says you have to be wise to eat meat because you're elevating the material world through the plant world, through the animal, into you. Every chicken's heartfelt tefillah is to be eaten by a tzaddik, so that he gets transmuted into spiritual energy. Every chicken's worst nightmare is to be eaten by a person who simply goes to sleep, or worse, does something bad with the energy that he absorbed from that chicken. And every carrot's heartfelt tefillah is to be eaten by a chicken that will be eaten by a tzaddik, and so forth and so on. Let's ask a few questions <coughs> about this process. Of chibur in eating. Chibur in eating. Chibur of Gufa Neshama. That's the secret of eating. Chibur of Gufa Neshama. You know, we see it in so many ways. Amazuman, for example. People eat together, it forms a bond. Even in the non Jewish world, you want to have a meeting with someone, it's over a meal. By the way, we celebrate all of Judaism over food. Today happens to be a fast day. Okay. But even that is significant. It's, a, it's, a, it's an abstaining from that aspect of the world to, to give us the ability to. Transcend the world, right? Yom Kippur, for example, is a fast that is the fast is eaten. In other words, it's an, it not they, they they say on Yom Kippur who could eat, on Tisha B'av they say who could eat on Yom Kippur who needs to. It's a form of transcendence. But even then, there's a mitzvah before Yom Kippur to eat. We celebrate our Judaism through eating. Why? Because it's a chibur of guf and neshama. That's exactly what's unique about us as Jews. Fasting is not unique about us as Jews. It's a means to an end. But eating is the end. In Olam Abba will not be an ultimate fast, it will be an ultimate feast. That is Chibu Gufa Neshama, which is what's unique about us. The non-Jewish world, the korban they bring is an oila. It's not eaten at all. It's completely transcendent. Our korbanas are elevated to Hashem and eaten. We live at the interface between two worlds, and that's exactly what food is. Let me ask a question or two that I hope you'll find thought-provoking. I'm sure everything I've set up to now is well known to you. Let me ask you an interesting question. Benching. Benching. We make a bracha after eating, we fulfill a Torah mitzvah, we eat bread, and we say our grace after meals. 
Something very strange about the benching is the fourth bracha. The fourth bracha. The first, Hazana Sakal, right? Hazana because uh, we have a mitzvah, the Torah says you eat and you bless on the food. Ala Aretz is the second because it says Ala Aretz and Teva shares. Coming into Eretz Yisrael, Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't say that bracha, Yeshua added it. David and Shlomo, Yerushalayim, the third bracha, the pinnacle of Eretz Yisrael. And then we have a very peculiar addition. A very peculiar addition. A Teva Ametiv. A Teva Ametiv. Why? To commemorate the fallen of Beitar. Very, very strange. When Beitar was destroyed by the Romans, and they were furious about the resistance at Beitar, they had to bring in legions from Asia Minor, they had to bring in, it took years to conquer Beitar. And they were so furious at the resistance of Beitar that when they finally conquered it, they issued a decree that the dead should not be buried. And the Jewish bodies lay in the fields for years, unburied, and miraculously, did not decompose, and miraculously were all brought to a Jewish burial. Right? There was a change of Roman government, and the edict was eventually became void, and those bodies... So after Beit was destroyed, there were Jewish bodies that lay in the Middle Eastern sun, in the Mediterranean heat. They did not decompose miraculously, and miraculously they survived in that form, perfect, until they were brought to a burial. Right? By the way, it's very interesting. That, in fact, was the last miracle we experienced. You know, people think Hanukkah was the last miracle we experienced. Hanukkah, the last miracle. After all, Hanukkah's post-biblical institute of Banshek Nessus Agdala, later than Purim. There's no Megillah of Hanukkah, no Nevoah anymore, right? not even a Mishnah. Hanukkah, a late edition, the last wave good Maya from the world of miracles. A light that burned for eight days, without prophetic intervention, as all the previous miracles were. But there was something after Hanukkah. Hanukkah is the last symbol, if you like, of a flame burning in the darkness of a pre-Messianic, tormented night, until finally the dawn breaks. But there was one further miracle, and that was the Debator. After Hanukkah, later than that, in the Roman era, there was a one further miracle. Um, Okay, we lost the connection. Let's see. Okay, I think we lost the connection. Can people hear me? Yes? Yeah, are we together? Okay. So, if you could... I'm muted. Uh, uh, uh. We're just going to try to get Rebecca cast back. Go okay, I'm, I'm right here, if you can hear me. Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. So, hmm. Beta was the last miracle. And there's an importance to that. It's not our subject directly. Some are going to point out that Beta was the last nace. In other words... What taste we, lef- we, we, we needed left in our mouths. Hanukkah, a reminder we'll meet again. Keep that flame burning. One further miracle. When you descend to the point of being a lifeless body, you'll be preserved. In other words, as you move through this gollus, which is a dimension of darkness and death, no more nevoah, no more infusion from the spiritual world to keep you alive, remember, Beta, those bodies did not decompose. They'll be brought to a tria. Very potent Last, last message from that world. But here's what's strange. What does it have to do with benching? You saying grace after meals, you had bread. You make three brochas that the Torah, one way or another, commands us. The rabbis saw fit to add a special brocha to the benching. Every time you've had bread, you add a blessing, the fourth blessing, to commemorate the dead of Beitar. What does that have to do with eating? Again, you want to make historical thing, put it into the Tisha B'Av service. There are many places you could put it. You want to commemorate the, the miracle of the dead of Beitar. Where do you do it? When you eat bread. What? As our children of this generation would say, Ma Kesher. What's the connection? I'd like to share with you something else. I heard from Ramosha Shapira. Today happens to be his yard site, right? My great teacher, our great teacher, Ramosha. Where's my photograph? Astounding Torah mind. An astounding mind. Perhaps the most astounding and mature mind I've ever met. So, he left us four years ago. He left us four years ago on Asara Batavis. Let me tell you something that he said about our Tova Mative. That's in honor of his great Neshama. Give him, a, give, him, give him some life in our, in our lives. Here's what he said. In Parakshira, Parakshira, as you know, Parakshira is a Mishnah, a Mishnaic statement which documents what every part of the Bria sings. Perikshira. 
what the dogs sing and what the birds sing. Every part of the creation sings a song. What, what does it mean to sing a song? It means it expresses its essence. Singing a song, that means bringing its circle to completion in service of Hashem, as it must. And every part of the creation sings a unique song. Perish here. Worth studying. Not many perushim on it. Few classics. In Perik Shira, it asks, what is the song of the wild animals? Chayyeh Sasode, Chayyeh Sabar, wild animals. Animals that have no human husbandry. I'm not talking about domestic animals, or cows or sheep. I'm talking about wild animals. Animals that have got no human control at all. Today, it's, fu- it's hard to find animals like that, because even the big game reserves like the Kruger National Park or the Serengeti, they have fences somewhere. Perhaps birds today. Perhaps birds, wild birds, are the only creatures that are completely unlimited. What do they sing? Hateva Metiv. Hateva Metiv. <laughs> what does that mean? The wild animals sing a song to Hashem. What's the song of the wild animals? Hateva Metiv. What's the connection? Why? Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky has a perush on Perik Shira, and he says something else. But I'll tell you what Ramashi Shapira said. This is beyond astounding. Okay? Beyond astounding. This is one of the few areas where you'll virtually see a miracle in the world. There are a few, few areas. And tonight's not the night or the time to talk about them. But here's one. You know what's unique about wild animals? No one knows where they die. No one knows where their bodies lie and decompose. No one knows. Let me, let me tell you. I'm a South African. I've spent many, many long days in the Kruger National Park observing the animals, the wild animals. And the last time I was there, a year ago, I asked one of the lead rangers, many, many, many years of experience, where do the dead animals go? He said, we don't know. Listen carefully, let me explain. I'm not talking about animal that gets eaten by another animal. I'm not talking about animal that's hit by your car, or poisoned, or a bird that your cat killed. I'm talking about animals that die natural deaths. Don't know where they die. There's a legend about an elephant's graveyard, they go someplace to die. There's a legend about a whale's graveyard. We don't know. Calculations have been made <coughs> that the city should be covered in a layer of dead birds and insects and rats and mice. Where did they go? You know, let me ask you a question. Did you ever walk out early one morning to a mate's minion and see an elderly pigeon fall out of a tree dead? Happened somewhere. How come you never saw it? Did you ever hear about somebody who saw it? Ever? You know, there are birds that migrate. And I'm choosing birds because probably they're the only ones today that are completely unlimited flow air wherever they want. No human limitation at all. Domestic animals, they die, absolutely. Your donkey, the horse, the cow, yeah, absolutely, they die. Your dog, your cat. Wild animals, nobody sees where they die. Do you know there are birds that migrate by the hundreds of thousands or the millions? Where do they die? They, they hatch at the same time. They fly 8,000 miles from north to south hemisphere. They, they have their, their nesting grounds. <laughs> they should, some sailor somewhere on an ocean liner should have seen a few elderly birds plop out of the sky. Why did nobody see an old snake die? The lions, when they get very old, they see their pads, their tracks, and they disappear. Why did we see them die? You know, in case you think I'm exaggerating, you know, I live in London today. In Trafalgar Square, there are thousands of pigeons. Thousands of pigeons. Where are the dead ones? Every morning, where the, the people come there to clean up, there should be a couple of dead birds. Where do they go? There was an, uh, an ornithologist called David Lack. He went into this. They don't know. Why didn't you see a, a, an insect? A little bird, visit your garden. Elderly. They don't all get eaten by cats. Where I live in London, there are not that many cats. You know, you know, there are places where there are not many cats. And thousands of birds. Why didn't you see one die ever? Where are they? I'm not claiming they disappeared into thin air. But they have an instinct. Hashem does something with them. They go someplace. Don't see Teva Metiv. The bracha made on dead bodies that did not decompose in a disgusting decomposition, and they were brought to a burial. Hashem takes care. The, you take care of your domestic animals. That's up to you, and they lie around smelling when they die. But the wild animals, the birds and the rats and the mice, right? no one knows where they die. They disappear. There are many cities in the world that have hundreds of thousands of pigeons. There can be a big problem someplace. Where are the dead ones? They don't... Before... The cats can eat them, <coughs> right? It's a serious problem for those who understand biology. Hatova Metiv. Hashem takes care of those, not you. And therefore, and therefore, that is the connection between Parakshira, that miracle, and the Brochavateva Metiv. The dead of Betar, 
Hashem took care of, just like He takes care of the wild animals. And wine benching, the secret is that benching is the celebration of the central and unique function of the human being, which is eating. And eating is the chibur. Not only a Muslim three people, ten people together, we start using Hashem's name. Right? There's an intense husband and wife eating together. Very special laws. <coughs> right? There's a bond that's set up <coughs> over food, because food is the essence of the bonding of Guf and Neshama. And that is, that's what's unique about food. And therefore, and therefore, when body and soul are correctly connected, you celebrate that with benching. The brachas you make over eating, Torah, Doraisa, right? Perhaps only Torah is the other bracha that has a Doraisa base. A Torah mitzvah is to make these other brachas Darabonin. This is the Torah itself mandates. And what is a bracha? Chibur. Hashem, you are the source of this apple. Baruch Ata Hashem. Hashem, you are the source of this apple. You're making that connection, that chibur. You know, yesterday was the death, the, the, the date of death of Ezra Sofer. End of the Anshayk Nessus Hagdola. They instituted brachas. Why did they institute brachas? There were no brachas necessary before. Because beforehand, when there was nevuah in the world, as Ramon Shapiro used to say, the world was incandescent with spiritual meaning. When you took an apple, the apple looked like a Dvar Hashem. The Davar word was the Davar object. An apple didn't look like an apple nebuch, it looked like a Dvar Hashem. And therefore it spoke to you. Every Davar object in the world spoke Davar its word to you. The world was a dialogue, a conversation. But now an apple, an apple nebuch looks like an apple. Now you've got to say, Hashem, you are the source of this apple before the apple said it. Prior, when Nebuah was around in the world, the world was luminous with spiritual meaning. Every object spoke its source. Now an object just looks like an object, looks like it evolved by accident. Another accident of nature. So you make a bracha. Bracha is now necessary. Now we, do, now we don't make a move without a bracha. We identify the source. And therefore, benching, you're identifying the source of what it means to be human. The first mitzvah, man was given certain foods to eat and certain foods not to eat. That defines you as a human being. Keep your body and soul connected correctly. That's kashrus, of course, as you all know. And therefore, the purpose of the human being is to be in the world to eat. Yeah, we do that naturally as Jews, but this is the meaning. And therefore, when you eat, that is special bracha, doraisa. And what is the bracha? On the connection. What is Eretz Israel? Why Israel? Israel is the place of Tchiyas Amesim. Israel is the place of Tchiyas Amesim. The Maral says, and Chazal say, Tchiyas Amesim will be from Eretz Israel. Israel is the place of Guf and Neshama joining. Right? It's the feminine dimension. This is why women love Eretz Israel. There's a lot to talk about here. But Israel is the place of ultimate connection, as the Ramban says. Mitzvahs are only fully applicable in Israel. And what are mitzvahs? Connection. Mitzvah means mitzav tachada, tzevet. Tzav tachada is a bond. Mitzvah bonds the source, the shama to the action. All the mitzvahs are actions. Virtually every mitzvah in the book. The book. Virtually every mitzvah is a physical action. You could count on one hand mitzvahs that aren't necessarily physical. The point of a mitzvah is to bond the spirit to the, to, to the action, to the world, to the material. And therefore, and therefore, mitzvahs that man was given were eating. And the prohibition was eating. And then, of course, on Shabbos he was meant to eat that as well. And therefore, the definition of the human being is an eating being in one sense. And therefore, when you eat bread, which is the foundation of food, you make a bracha, doraisa, and then you say a tevamativ. Bodies connected to neshamas. And the final commemoration was bodies with no neshamas that did not decompose miraculously and counterintuitively and exact. That's the perfect place. And therefore, Beta s- celebrates the fact that neshamas needed to keep a body alive and the great miracle of bodies even without neshamas that remained intact till they can be brought to a tree. Exactly when you eat is the time to think about that. And by the way, What's the other bracha we make that is Doraisa? Torah. What is Torah? Food for the neshama. Food and drink. Food and drink keep the body alive. Torah and mitzvahs keep the neshama alive. And that's the parallel between food that keeps the body alive in this world and Torah that keeps the neshama alive. You eat and drink Torah and mitzvahs. You know, you know, Rashi and the Ramban. Right? So, so Rashi tells you, Rashi tells you, the separation in Brashis. The Torah talks about the separation between the upper and the lower waters. The upper and the lower waters. The Rashi tells you the separation. How far are separated the upper and the lower waters? The Ramban says, don't even try to understand that Rashi. Don't even try to understand that Rashi. That's so deep, don't even try to understand it. So why did Rashi tell us? 
Rashi's a perush. Why did Rashi tell us the separation between the upper and the lower waters that the Ramban says you cannot understand? Rav Simcha Vassaman used to talk about this. Rav Simcha Vassaman, my great teacher. Rav Simcha used to say, <coughs> there's some foods that you eat. When you eat the food, you chew it, and then you swallow it. When you chew, that's under voluntary control, and you taste it. What's unique about the first phase of eating? You put the food in your mouth, you chew it, that's under voluntary control, and you taste it, and then you swallow. When you swallow, it goes into the involuntary system, and you no longer taste it. Once you've swallowed it, no taste, and no voluntary control. Your body does what it has to do automatically. And that's where you get the true benefit. In the mouth, you have a voluntary control, and you chew it, and you enjoy it, you taste it. When you swallow it, no more control, no more enjoyment, but that's where the benefit is absorbed. Some foods, you need to swallow without chewing. Sometimes, you need a vitamin. Take a vitamin tablet. Don't try to chew it, you'll break your teeth. Just swallow it. No taste, no control. But once you've swallowed it, it does what it needs to do. The Ramban is telling you this. That rush is a vitamin tablet. That's what Rasimcha used to say. Now, don't, don't try and chew that rush, you'll break your teeth. Just swallow it. You need it. Rashi knows that your Neshama needs that vitamin tablet, and he put it in. Uh, but, uh, beautiful idea. But the point is, that Torah mitzvahs are food for the Neshama. They keep Neshama connected to its source, just like food in this world keeps Neshama connected to its body, its vessel. And therefore, and therefore, <coughs> when we are eating, right, and eating correctly, establishing the Kedusha of that connection between the two. That is why there's a mitzvah derisa of benching, and that's why there's another mitzvah derisa of on Torah, because Torah is the, um, the food. Just like food for the body, Torah and mitzvahs are food for the higher elements of the neshama, and that is the chibur. And what's unique about us as Jews, maybe finish with this, this thought, what's unique about us, is exactly that chibur. Exactly. As I tried to say, explain before, the non-Jewish world, transcendent. Right? Transcendent, very high. Cannot bring that down here. It's ridiculous. How can that, that level of Kedusha? That's why the non-Jewish world requires intermediaries. The ninth of Teves, 8th, nine, and 10th of Teves. 8th, the Torah translated into Greek. Chibur, to the external world. Ninth of Teves, death of Ezra, Sefer, birth of the founder of Christianity. And the 10th, beginning of the destruction. Right? What's the founding of Christianity? What is that? The notion that you cannot connect to the spiritual world, you need an intermediary. You can't do it directly. You, your contaminated excrement-containing body, and your finite sinful reality, what do they say in their prayers? Forgive us, Lord, for we are sinners. We never say that. We say, forgive us, Hashem, because we have sinned. We never call ourselves sinners. We're not sinners. We people, we're creatures of Kedusha. We never call ourselves sinners. But they are. And their connection is always through an intermediary. Always through an intermediary. And therefore they need to connect to an intermediary, which is what Avodah Zara is. Connect. And therefore, who's their intermediary? Who's their intermediary? They're Jew. Why? Because the Jews are directly connected. And they need to connect through intermediary. Right? Have you, Moshe David Vali, great contemporary of the Ramchal and friend of the Ramchal, he says his father told him that when the Pasuk says, <coughs> to Esav, Yitzchak says to Esav, you will serve your brother. He says it has another overtone. You will worship your brother. You'll end up worshipping a Jew. You, Esav, your culture, Christian culture, will end up worshipping a Jew. Why? Because we have no sar. We are co directly connected. We're above the Mazalis. And they sense that there's too great a gap. And so they need to make that connection through an intermediary. And therefore, in their world, you're either up and you cannot connect with the body, or you're down in the body, you cannot connect with Kedusha. Right? We just lived through that. This is the, this is the day in case you didn't realize. This is the day of the Christian, the Christian day. And that's exactly our connection. And that is exactly what food is and where Mashkichim come in and your work, your holy work. Because we, correct, we connect directly. Paradoxically and amazingly, we can take a potentially contaminated body and we can connect it to a source of Kedusha. It's an unthinkable thing that a finite body, totally in common with the animal, with all its deficiencies and its humiliating aspects, that can connect directly through no intermediary at all, that can connect to the source. That is the history of man. Adam was created to eat, to make the correct 
correct connection between guf and neshama. And he's put into a place of essential food. What are eights? What's an eights? Gan Eden. What's an eights? Eights is etzem. Eights means etzem, right? The body, the bone of the thing, the actuality. But etzem. An eights, a garden of trees, a zone of real essence. That's what food is. And that's what trees are. And therefore he is put in there. Don't touch that one tree. That will come on Shabbos. Don't eat it prematurely. The rest you eat. You, you absorb the world into you. And you transmute it into Kedusha that way. That's what's unique about you. And that's what's unique about us as Jews. We can make that. And therefore our eating is holy. Our eating is holy. It's not a fallen concession to a body. It's a work of connecting the body to the world of Kedusha. And you do that potently when you eat. The mouth is the organ of connection. Speech. You connect thought into action. Right? That's what speech is. And therefore, the same organ <coughs> that does speaking is the organ that does eating. The mouth has three functions. I don't want to keep you late. I know you must have had a long day, but I'll finish with this idea. The mouth has three functions. <coughs> eating, speaking, and kissing. Three natural human functions. Eating, chibur, guf and neshama. Speaking, chibur, between people, between guf and neshama. Concept and thought expressed in action in the world. And kissing is the natural human connection. And how bizarre is that? You want to show affection for somebody, you put your mouth on them. Especially in this COVID era. Unthinkable. <clears throat> Think about how, speaking medically, what could be more bizarre than putting your mouth on somebody? I mean, how weird is that? You don't think it's weird because the first thing you were conscious of when you were a little baby was your mother putting your mouth on over you. and sl- But it's unthinkable. But that's why we do it. The mouth, the organ of connection. And therefore the kiss is intimate connection. Same part of the body that is used for speaking, intimate connection. And same part of the body that's used for eating. Right? Which is the, what's lechem? What's lechem? The ultimate bread? Lahalchim is to weld, to solder together. Milchama is also connected. But lahalchim is to weld and join and bond together. And that's what lechem is. Anyway, Rabbi Fishman, thank you very much for this opportunity. This is an endless subject. But we are great admirers of your work, all of you. You are the ones who maintain that chibur in its purity. We owe the correct connection between body and soul to you. Nothing could be more important. Thank you very much. And on this fast day, when we desist from that activity, only to re-enter it again on Shabbos, we think of that. And we think about those bodies that did not decompose, so that we can finally be brought to an ultimate chibur. Thank you very much.